Welcome to the Inconvenient Minority Podcast. I'm your host, Kenny Shu. Joining me today is Daisy Cousins. Daisy Cousins is an Australian political YouTuber, a commentator, cultural commentator. She is a commentator on Sky News, actually, which is um, a major international media market. Um, and so, Daisy, it's so great to hear you. Thank you so much for having me. So pleased to be here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, Daisy, uh, one of the things that, um, that, that really struck me, um, about you, uh, I was just stumbling one day and I, I came across, um, one of your videos, um, and for the audience, Daisy does a lot of uh, great videos, talks about, um, beauty, talks about woke culture, um, talks about what's going on in the social justice movement, especially with regards to, um, actually Barbie, um, And uh, tell me about how you got kind of interested in Barbie and and, and what you kind of have to say about that. Well, it was sort of um, an accident that I I kind of discovered this weird sort of wokeness phase that that Barbie and I think Mattel just generally um, are going through. You know, uh, on my quest for content one day, you know, I was I was I'm thinking I've got to find some good SJW content. It's out there. And like the first place you go for that is Twitter. (laughs) <laughs> basically yeah. it. and I think someone had just posted something about this weird video um from the Barbie Instagram page and I didn't even know Barbie had videos on his Instagram page I thought oh that's okay so oh, fine I'll click that and it was this Black Lives Matter themed um proper critical race theory propaganda piece disguised as two of the Barbie's in cartoon form, pretending to do a video blog, and it was it was huh. it was basically the, sort of a fictional scenario they created of white Barbie and one of Barbie's black friends talking about all, all the the racism that this black friend of Barbie's apparently faces and how how it's pervasive and and this that and the other and it was a long like a, like four minutes or so long it wasn't like thirty seconds and it was on the Instagram page. And also their YouTube channel, and I thought, what is this doing on a on a um, in a target market where the the audience is literally just above toddler age? We're not even talking preteens here because they all. I, I looked at the Barbie target market, like preteens, like older things. You know, kids grow up quicker. We're talking like five and below and I'm like well, well yeah. what, what is that <laughs> what is that doing there that's crazy um so I sort of I thought well this this could be a nice lead here you know cult, cultural kind of thing and I tell you what the Barbie Instagram page is teeming with this kind of left-wing um social justice political content to the point where they actually had like an election themed Barbie doll range where you could be the candidate and then you could be the 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 um the manager and the campaign man like and all these different roles and I'm like you are marketing these products to little children I mean it was it was wow. just the most sort of blatant audacious uh propagandizing and all of it coming from the left so let's let's paint the picture here for the audience so uh, you know I watched your video um and I watched the video of what Barbie is doing here. So when I took a look at the video for the audience, um, basically what happens is that everybody really knows who Barbie is. You know, she is, um, um, you know, a, a toy and a doll that is made for young children, especially young girls. Um, and in this video that Daisy is referencing, you know, Barbie talks with, I guess, a, a black friend of <laughs> Barbie, uh, you know, Barbie is blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, white, white skin and those kinds of things. And she's talking with a black friend and this black friend is basically admitting to Barbie, you know, on this video, Hey, um, you know, uh, the world doesn't understand me because they, they denigrate me and they denigrate my beauty because I'm darker skinned, you know, then I, you know, I'm less beautiful. Um, first of all, Daisy, do you think that that is true? Do you think that people who are darker skinned are considered less beautiful in Western culture? I, it's an interesting uh, question, is it? Because that's yeah. what we sort of hear. I don't necessarily think that's that's true in Western culture. I mean, certainly, it's only in the last kind of ten, maybe fifteen years that they've started. Oh, well, I've noticed anyway, using more and more kind of black and brown 
models, for instance, in magazines and catalogs and catalogs. And that and that's kind of a, a reality as you know, sort of culture moves forward. I mean, you know, obviously sort of um standards change, um, you know, people start talking about representation, etc. And I don't I don't have any problem with that at all. I think that's great. I think, you know, in in fashion and in art, um variety of of culture and ethnicity in, in beautiful always adds to things because it's it's interesting. Um and I, but I've never sort of um I've never bought into the idea in in Western culture, at least in the last sort of 20 years, that being paler um, is somehow more beautiful. I mean, when you've got, you know, people like Kim Kardashian, for instance, who's been sort of, you know, who's very, you know, ethnic and been at the forefront of community. And and also um, think about it, even like prior to that, Everyone in Western culture seems to want to have darker skin. That's why we have fake tan, you know, and we, we, we go to tanning salons to get darker and darker and darker. So when there's this sort of commentary about this apparent Eurocentric standard of beauty in Western countries, I'm like, oh, ha- hang on a minute. Then why, why does everyone want to have darker skin? Like, now if you go somewhere, say, like um, Asian countries, for instance, or, or in yeah, India especially, yeah. that's where darker skin is is really denigrated. You know, they, they, they have like, you know, Indian actresses are always really pale, for instance. So, yeah, she'll go to non-Western countries, you'll get that. But I've, I've never really bought it to that extent in Western culture. Yeah. And that, that's really interesting you mentioned that. And uh, so you were, um, you did you did a while in the film industry, right? I spent a little little bit of time in the in the entertainment industry, yeah. In the entertainment industry, so you're kind of familiar with you know the camera and you know producers and and those kinds of things. It, it, it you you mentioned an interesting point. You say actually you know being darker, you know in Western cultures is 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 act, can actually be considered a good thing. So then. If, if in fact, which I actually agree with you, I mean, I think that, you know, all, all of my friends, especially my female friends are always saying like, oh, you know, if I could get more tan or something like that, or if I could look darker, I got really dark over the summer, it looks great and stuff like that. And I mean, go for them, good for them. But if, if it is in fact, you know, the truth, then why do we have this narrative today that is being uh, targeted at young women uh, from you know, icons, fashion, beauty icons like Barbie, in, in which, you know, a, a young girl's self-conception of themselves as a body and as a person, why are we getting this messaging that from this person that being dark is, uh, is associated in our culture with uh, um, being not as attractive or maybe, uh, you know, a lowering of beauty standard? I think um, it's really because it's sort of trendy, it's culturally very trendy. I mean, popular culture is is so drenched in this kind of uh, like people sort of call it cultural Marxism, but it, it's it's this strange sort of woke um, critical race theory narrative that everyone lives on some sort of you know matrix of oppression, and this group this group is I call it the the oppression Olympics. You know, everyone has a certain amount of oppression points based on their gender, race, skin color, etc. Or, or you can look at it like a pyramid, and of course, at, at the very bottom of the pyramid um, are straight white men because they don't <laughs> they don't have the oppression points that you know um, women do or, or black people do, uh, etc. And because that, that is so trendy in popular culture whether it's, you know, um, twactivists, as I like to call them, Twitter activists like Alyssa Milano or, you know, or, um, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who jumps well into it. She jumps between popular culture and politics, um, etc. cetera. It's, it's what's trendy to talk about nowadays. And the thing about Barbie um, and big corporations generally who jump on these woke narratives, um, it's all because they want to make money. Um, like I, it, it, I've heard it described as woke capitalism. They'll jump on whatever kind of you know trend there is um, and, and push their products toward it, so they can jump on the hashtags and people will pay attention to them, um, etc. So it all does come down to a capitalism, which is ironic because that's what social justice warriors hate. <laughs> and we'll get to the we'll get to the capitalism part uh, very shortly, I'm sure. But I, I wanted to circle back um, and maybe. Uh, challenge you a little bit uh, because I was looking at data from the uh, dating app OkCupid okay and Match and you're allowed to select people's races and those kinds of things in those kinds of places and actually it does appear according to the OkCupid okay data that on the on the female side black women are selected at lower rates um, in terms of swiped are selected at lower rates um, mm. than other races. And then it also seems on the other side of the coin, uh, on males, actually 
um, black men and Asian men are actually selected at much lower rates than uh, white men and then Latino men as well. Um, do you, I mean, what do you see That's in that? That's really interesting. I didn't know that. How fascinating. Um, look, perhaps then there is, and, and we should sort of assume this, maybe there is a disconnect then between popular culture and, and reality. Uh, you know what I mean? And often there is, that you see this kind of, you know, propagandizing in the kind of culture, pop culture uh, realm of, you know, more and more black models and brown models, et cetera. And, you know, um, oh, everything is beautiful, et cetera, et cetera. But then like you jump, you jump to reality and perhaps, and, and often it is, it is totally different. I mean, that's why so many social justice warriors, let's call them, get, have been shocked over the last few years at recent election results. Obviously there was Trump 2016 and even Trump 2020 because the Republican Party did so well. Um, aside from the presidency, often, often there is a kind of disconnect there between messaging and what really goes on. Um, as to whether it's to do with beauty specifically, I mean, um, when people are on on those apps, and unless they're just looking for a you know a casual fling, which a lot of people are, but if you're looking for yeah. a partner, you're thinking ideally more uh, beyond looks. So since you know white people are sort of the majority in number, maybe people sort of gra- gravitate towards people who are going to be culturally similar. Um, there could be a whole lot of other things going on there um, than standards of, of beauty, you know, just hypothetically. But that is that is an interesting, a very interesting point. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. And, you know, it's something that, you know, as I've been writing my book and finishing up my book, An Inconvenient Minority, it's about Asian Americans and um, the diversity, the left's diversity ideology as it relates to um, suppressing Asian American excellence oftentimes, which is kind of interesting. Stereotypes do exist. I mean, it, there's there's no doubt that, you know, there is a stereotype that Asian Americans are good at math and potentially that affects especially male Asian Americans, you know, when they are... Um, uh, when they're, you know, trying to go out and socialize and things like that, maybe they don't want to have that assumption about them because that implies that they're kind of nerdy or something like that. But, you know, this is a question I actually wanted to ask you, Daisy, because you live in Australia and Australia has a very high percentage, I think, of, um, Asian people and people of Asiatic descent. And do you, um, do you, do you see a lot of them? Do you interact a lot of them? And how do you, how are they perceived within Australian culture? Yeah, there are. there's a very high um, Asian population in Australia, like generally because of our proximity aside from anything else. We, got, we get an awful lot of international students, especially from China, um, coming through. So, uh, And there are certain um, areas, uh, say I grew up in Sydney, for instance, and there are particular like suburbs in these cities which have very, very high um, Asian populations. Like there's a suburb called, you know, Chatswood, um, Epping, you know, that kind of area in Sydney. Um, in Brisbane, the suburb of Sunnyvale, um, so they're they're, it, they're they're around an awful lot, and what's uh, as to how they're they're perceived. Um, there is that perception, you know, that Asians are good at math, like you know, the, the stereotype sort of exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the thing is. Um, I hate to kind of say it, but they but they really do back it up, at least in Australia. I mean, in selective schools in Australia, for instance, something like 95% of students in selective schools are of Asian ethnicity, um, they, and they, they dominate the high school rankings. They do brilliantly um, at university um, because they bring with them, and I sound like I'm stereotyping, but it, it, it's true. You, you see it in the results and how well they do. They just, they, they work really, really, really hard. They bring a particular work ethic um, that I find that Caucasians just don't have culturally. Um, and it's it's interesting to kind of see that. I've never, I mean, obviously I'm not of Asian descent, so I, I can't speak from that exact perspective. Um, I've never noticed a sort of Asians are good at math and nerdy, um, being put forward in sort of a detrimental context, though. It, it, it's hard to explain. I mean, Australia is such a multicultural uh, society. I would say we are probably the most sec- uh, most successful multicultural society in the world because, um, wow. yeah, 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 it, we do really well because uh, people who, you know, live in Australia, you have what they, I like to call kind of like the mama, the big mama culture. So, you know, there's the kind of the general Australian society. But... Um, 
different ethnic groups have their different kind of cultural um, traditions that they hang on to and practice sort of in their own communities, but everyone is generally very, very assimilated and integrated, so we're all kind of able to partake um, in each other's cultures. So um, and I think that might be, you know, slightly different to maybe to the USA and maybe to other cultures, but um, I've, I've never noticed it really put forward culturally here in any in any kind of truly uh derogatory way but that's just me <laughs> that is me. that is no it's totally no that's so interesting that is so interesting you mentioned australia you you really you make this contention that australia is you know one of the best multicultural societies uh, in the world um and you know obviously america tends to pride itself on its diversity and everything like that but, but so, I mean, elaborate, elaborate more on that. Like why, why do you think that, um, do you, I mean, do you think Australia is actually even superior to the United States in terms of its relationship with, you know, a multiracial society? Um, it's sort of, I mean, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time, um, in the USA, um, it's. It, I think Australia. We do. We do particularly well in the fact that we have. I mean, I know. You know, I mentioned the suburbs where you know there's you know lots of Asian people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but we don't. We don't sort of have. We don't have the problems with kind of enclaves like the. The UK is probably a good contrast. Um, very good. They do have a lot of problems there with ethnic enclaving. Um, in London, for instance, um, I think it is because of Australia's immigration laws. Uh, that we do so well. Like Australia has um, some really, really tight immigration laws. Like it is, there are lots of ways to get into Australia. There are lots of different types of visas you can get, but you have you have to come here le- legally. And we we have it like, much easier than other countries with controlling borders and the fact that we're an island. Like I always say, we don't need a, <laughs> yeah. we don't need a wall because we've got a moat. Like it, it's really hard to get here. And um, we've had. Um, issues in the past, where, like really real tragedies with people coming over by boat from countries like Indonesia and just, you know, thousands of people drowning at sea and ending up in detention camps offshore, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it is made very clear in the countries just offshore that if you come here by boat, you you will not get in. Like, you know, the, it's a way of um, sticking it to the people smugglers who will present a kind of paradise but but and exploit people, you know. Um, so so because the immigration laws are so tight we are, and there's a big emphasis on skilled migration um, as well, people really do come here with the intent of integrating. Like, you know, you come here with it, with, it, with your skills and your education and you've gone through such trouble to get the visa, you spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on, on visas. People don't come here to sit in an enclave. Um, so while Australia gets denigrated by the kind of globalist open borders crowd in Europe for being so tough um, on our immigration laws, it really, it, it does, it does work for us, I think. Okay. That is okay. That's, that's great to hear. Um, yeah. And I can definitely see how, you know, Australia, it's, it's a little bit harder <laughs> to uh, get into Australia illegally. Unless you, unless you are a terrific <laughs> swimmer, terrific at swimming, yeah. <laughs> you're probably <laughs> going to have a bit of trouble. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's good because, um, I think it shows us that, you know, we, I think it's promising because in the United States right now, Daisy, you know, we have this sort of crisis of multiculturalism right now um, where, you know, we have this multicultural diverse society, but it's, you know, people always like to say in America, you know, diversity is always inherently good. And, you know, I'm going to say, I'm going to say this about it. I think diversity can be really, really good if it is done and handled correctly, but if it is handled incorrectly, you know, having, and it's, there's no grounding, there's no central grounding that holds people together. And there's no central ethic that work that holds people together. You know, um, it, it has tendencies to flare up a lot of tensions. I mean, in America today, you know, the, the cultural epicenter of the world, you know, we're, we're having great racial tension right now, uh, between uh, white Americans and black Americans uh, because the previous consensus of political correctness and, you know, oh, we don't talk about race, we don't talk about that kind of thing and is, is sort of, it's, it's sort of collapsing on itself. And that, that whole idea is, is, is giving way in America, the whole idea of, um, of uh, you know, you don't mention yours and I don't mention mine 
that and you, you you keep a tight sort of political correctness in America, that idea is 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 caving away and giving way just at a rapid clip to social justice and woke um, critical race theory, which is people are now fighting for oppression points um, in America, fighting to actually be distinguished based on race. Like people want people to recognize that they are an oppressed minority. Uh, or so-called an oppressed minority and those kinds of things. And I think that that shows there are deep rifts right now in our country in terms of a multicultural society. But I think what Australia shows, which is really interesting, is that there is promise. You can have a, I mean, according to you, you can't have um, a solid multicultural society, but you have to have a, I mean, in one, at least in one sense, one ingredient to that is you need strong borders and you need um, a, 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 a way that brings people together. Yeah, um, I find it so fascinating what's going on in the USA at the moment with the kind of critical race theory um, influence. Because you know, as you as you've mentioned, um, you, you think of you know Martin Luther King. You know, I, I dream that my little girls will be able to be judged not by the color of their skin, by the content, but by the content of their character, which I just think is is about one of the most wonderful things anyone has ever said. It is. It's just. It's beautiful and and moving. And I I grew up um, and until very recently uh, with the concept that that is anti racism. You know, not not considering people's skin color as their first and foremost defining factor, but their thoughts and their feelings and their opinions and you know all of that kind of stuff with skin color being just one aspect of them. But it, it has changed um, or it is changing with a no, small but noisy, very noisy minority. Um, into if you don't recognize people's race, then that is racist. Like it's to- it's totally uh, flipped. And I find that to be, uh, it's a cliched word, but I find that to be about the most divisive thing um, that anyone can conceptualize because of, of course that is going to uh, create racial tension because if you're, you know, for one thing, it'll, it'll, if if you if you're the type if you are being constantly told that you are a victim and an oppressed minority and thinking of yourself that way and trying to be a victim that's terrible for your psyche and, and your your mind and and your, that gives you a sense of hopelessness that everything you do will always be for nothing because your race is always going to hold you back and it's also going to uh, create resentment. Um, among other races, uh, specifically white people, because white people, you know, the bottom of the pyramid, um, which is going to make people more racist. But it's all it's all done under the guise of anti-racism. Um, and it is it is so tragic uh, because it can only end badly. And we've started seeing we saw that bad end will start the start of the bad end last year with the Black Lives Matter riots. Daisy, what do you mean that white people are at the bottom of the pyramid? Well, in terms of if we're thinking in sort of the terms of, you know, intersectional theory and sort of what they call sort of overlapping matrix of oppression, um, white people are considered what they, they sort of the dominant group, the dominant culture, the, the majority group who therefore have, you know, the upper hand in all things society. And if you look at, you know, statistics on, um, you know, the average household wealth, et cetera, um, it certainly looks like that. You know, it looks like that sort of on paper, but, you know, that, that takes out a, any kind of, um, you know, poverty loop that different, you know, people get caught in, et cetera, you know, and also if that were a flawless system, then there would be no poor white people anywhere and there would be no wealthy black Hispanic people everywhere either. Like it doesn't actually stack up. But if you just look at it superficially on paper, um, it can very much be made to look like that. So, you know, um, say the opinions of white people um, are given less weight by intersectionalists, for instance, because they apparently have all the privilege and societal power. And it also, it only works if you look at people in terms of being groups rather than individuals. Yeah, yeah. So by by white people at the bottom of the pyramid, you mean white people have the least amount of, uh, I guess, social capital or social justice capital to be able to speak yeah, out. Yeah, they have the least amount of oppression points. Right, at least amount of oppression points. Then, Asian people are a little bit higher than white people, but still below. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, <laughs> and, uh, it's so interesting. You know, Hispanic people it's and then so in- below black. Yeah, people. yeah, yeah. I'm, it's interesting the way that um, Asian people are now being conceptualized. Because correct me if I'm wrong, but haven't there been universities 
you know, in quote unquote, positively discriminating against Asian people nowadays, because they, they come in with fantastic results. So they're, they're, they're might be shirked for, you know, a black person or a Hispanic person in the same way that whites are as well. So, Right. And, I, and I'm wondering, is that going on in Australia right now? Like, is there any movement? Do you guys see, is there, are there politicians that are saying like, oh, look, you know, our top universities are like 95% Asian. We need to really curb that. Not in terms, not, well, not that I have noticed in terms of a kind of diversity thing. There's a worry here with the universities and the CCP, um, you know, but yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, in terms of, you know, an organization called the Confucius Center, which is, you know, integrated into a lot of universities and it's, uh, yeah, 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 there's a worry there for our kind of national uh, security of universities sort of being maybe financially beholden, certain universities being financially beholden to the CCP. But that's very much to do with China, the state rather than, um, you know, Chinese people ethnically. So I haven't noticed that happening last year. Is there an Australian left? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they borrow an awful lot um, culturally from the American progressives. Like I, I think um, people ask me sometimes why I spend so much time on American politics. Um, Americans don't realise what a huge flow-out effect American politics and popular culture has on Australia. Like I would, we, I know people in Australia who are more invested than you, in US elections than a lot of Americans are. And I think it actually affects how people vote in our elections here. We spend, yeah, we get so much of it sort of through the media, et cetera. Um, like it is in Australia, just like it is in America, it is socially unacceptable to publicly declare yourself to be a Trump supporter. Like it's the exact same. You will be shunned in the exact same um, way. But they, there is an Australian left, certainly. They, they're they very similar to the Americans. They, they populate the inner cities. Um, they vote for our progressive party, which is the Greens. They make up about 10% of the vote. I think they're about the same percentage of them as they are in the US. But um, they're there and they're noisy. <laughs> very noisy that okay that that just reminds me you know i i used i used to study abroad in scotland and in scotland you know when when america was talking all about this um you know uh when and i know actually recently it's become more of an issue but when transgenderism was a big issue back in 2015 2016 it's like it's kind of like when something becomes a huge issue in america you like wait 2 years or something like that and then it just becomes a huge issue in like all the other western <laughs> countries and then and then it comes from all the other western countries and goes to like african countries and latin american countries and it's just it's just it just reminds me like you want to talk about privilege like america is still the cultural capital of the world. Oh, totally. <laughs> I mean, there's just not really a way to deny no. it. I mean, we are like, in terms of our cultural influence on the world, we're just, we're just, we're, we're still at the oh, epicenter, yeah. I would head, say. head, shoulders and waist above everyone else. Like, definitely. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I wanted to, I, I know I introduced you talking about Barbie and then we went on a couple <laughs> of tangents about, uh, <laughs> you know, about Australian culture, about Asians, you know, about beauty standards, those kinds of things. But I did want to, you know, come back to, um, you know, what, what you were talking about Barbie, because to me, Barbie is so interesting. You know, Barbie, I, in my understanding of Barbie, and feel free to correct me, but my understanding of Barbie, at least symbolically, is that, you know, Barbie is, is, is one of the first ways that like, a that a girl, that a young girl, you know, really starts to, um, I guess, get a, con a conceptualized like beauty and, and, and their physical, um, you know, in physical stature and those kinds of things. What, what do you think about well, that? Well, it, de it depends on the parents. Like, I, I was never allowed to play with Barbie dolls growing up ever. Like, uh, yeah, 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 because, because of that kind of unrealistic view that they give of um, a, a woman's physique. Um, so I, I never had much to do with Barbie growing up. I think the only Barbie doll I had was a fairy Barbie, and that was because she had, like, holes in her wings and you could dip her in, um, like, soapy water and run around and she'd, like, flow bubbles behind. So that was that was really, that was really <laughs> fun. Um, but, so, but that was the only Barbie doll uh, that I had. But for kids who, who do play with Barbie, particularly since the target market nowadays is so young, um, yeah, it, it can be the very first 
you know, notion they have of the feminine form. Um, and I, I think that that can be quite damaging because Barbie is, I guess, you know, if you want to talk about unrealistic standards of beauty, that's, that's very much an unrealistic standard of beauty. And Barbie has tried to, you know, fix that in the last, you know, few years. There's been, the, you know, focus on body positivity and they, they've sort of, they've done it by bringing in, you know, different um, races of Barbie. You know, you have black Barbies and, and, you know, Hispanic Barbies and I think, which I think is great, you know, it's good to present a variety of people to little girls. But that skinny kind of figure um it's it's still there and that's what I, what I was thinking when I was making that video I thought gosh you know you guys can go on and be anti-racist and talk about you know women in politics but you're still presenting to little girls these tiny skinny wasted big breasted adult dolls you know they haven't really done anything fully substantive uh to change that it's interesting yeah. And it reminds me of woke capitalism, right? Because it reminds me, I mean, this is kind of a symbol for, you know, we can have uh, people of all races that make us yeah. money, you know, <laughs> that, that <laughs> it's kind of, it's, it's, it's the whole idea of, you know, okay, we're going to, we're going to catch on to this trend. We're going to ride, ride this wave, but in the end, we're going to protect, you know, our core consumer product, even if we're not sure if the effects of that product, you know? So, I mean, I think that there's something to say about that in terms of Barbie. Well, yeah, I, I, I think so. Yeah. Because that is sort of, there, there is something sort of mystical about the way Barbie looks. I mean, you know, people have, have said for years and years and years that it's, it's damaging, but it is, it is, sort of, it's appealing. You know, she's, she's very pretty. If you're a little girl and you like, you know, pretty things, well, you, you're going to like a pretty Barbie doll. So I like the way you put it when you say, you know, they'll, they'll jump on these trends, but at the end of the day, they'll protect their kind of core uh, brand because that's, essentially what sells like if if they had like a a plus size barbie like a a a rounded like size you know if it was a real person real woman like you know size 18 barbie i don't know if don't they don't they have those plus size barbies though now i think i saw something i haven't seen um many of them and there's i haven't seen a kind of mainstream range of them but if they had like you know lizzo barbie for instance she you know she's a large woman i don't i don't know actually how many people would buy it because she's not that kind of core uh, Barbie thing that that appeals. And it was interesting when I was researching for that video, I found some interviews on YouTube with the head honchos um, about wokeness, you know, from 2018 about wokeness and, you know, um, race and things like that. And the interviewer said to one of the the big head honchos, she said, "Oh, you know, there's pe- people who've said that you're you're you know you're you're getting really woke." And her answer struck me because she just said, "Oh, we love that association." She didn't say, "Oh, yeah, we're really woke and into." So she just said, "No, we love the association." You know, that's that's not saying that you're genuinely woke. That's yeah, we're jumping on that bandwagon yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah let's 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 milk that oh, cash yeah, cow yeah 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 was that the look in her eyes when she said it i thought oh i'm so on to you i'm on to you <laughs> well it reminds me of uh it reminds me of what the nfl did with colin uh colin kaepernick with what the media did with social justice the nfl did with sports as well i mean just like this is almost like the i don't know if you you're familiar because since you're australian but um uh, over the past couple of years, the NFL has been on this uh, big campaign to uh, to be more aware and uh, racially aware and and plug into this um, social justice movement, especially in the wake of. Uh, do you know Colin yeah, Kaepernick? I, I do. do you know I know. Is? I know all about the kneeling, the kneeling with the anthem, and yeah, his yeah, his protests and and those kinds of things and. Um, the NFL has really, really tried that hard. I mean, I'm a, I've been a football watcher for, you know, 10 years now. And the, uh, I can tell this year the NFL is making a huge marketing push to be in line with the social justice movement. And, you know, to me, it's it's really interesting. I think you and I are coming to the same conclusion. Uh, I feel like it's a business decision, you know? <laughs> Uh, I feel like there's a, there's money in that now. There's money, there's praise. It's an easy way for you to get mainstream plaudits. Um, and to be visible. 
without having yeah into yeah being visible. um that's very that's very true it's it's, a, it's and not only that i think it's also a way to kind of placate the activists because we've all seen how a great like you know they may they would seriously burned down like the NFL headquarters I reckon if they if they thought, if they thought that they were doing anything non-work so it's a way of going oh god we'll just do this now and the activists will leave us alone and we won't get all of you know the terrible you know email campaigns and boycotts and stuff that we expect but it's it's sort of flawed because it's it's not necessarily a good business decision in terms of who actually thinks what in the population I mean in in 2018 there was a study that came out called Hidden Tribes, and it was um, it was a, a, a sort of dissection of America's political landscape, and it put it put people into seven tribes. I mean, the, they called the left wing and the right wing, and then people in the middle. And the left wing was progressives, the right wing was conservatives and devout conservatives, and then you had liberals and centrists and apolitical and all that. And progressives, interestingly enough. Uh, they were the second smallest group after devout conservatives. The eight eight percent, only eight huh. percent of America's political landscape they found to be progressives, uh, and so so they're actually only marketing to a very small amount of people. And, and whereas on the conservative side, the right wing, because they included the two groups, they found twenty five percent of America to be you know cons- conservative or a devout conservative, which is so they're actually. While that, you know, 8%, you know, reflective of 2018 uh, minority is noisy, that's that's not a large minority of people they're actually marketing to. Yeah. So that raises the question then, are they marketing, and I think you're the ideal person to discuss this with, are they, are people like Mattel and Barbie, um, you know, talking this, this um, woke talk and also this, um, this, uh, uh, very um, gung ho sort of uh, feminist talk with Barbie. Um, it's all, you know, um, which we we can get to in a bit. But um, is this? Are they marketing to little? Look, like little girls who actually play with Barbies probably don't care much about this woke stuff. Like if they didn't say this woke stuff, they wouldn't necessarily be mad. So are they really marketing towards a market or are they just trying to stymie? And there's three options here. Are they actually marketing towards a market? Are they like trying to stymie public criticism of them? Or are there actually ideological people within the system, within the business that are actually interested in in educating and changing kids' minds in this direction? Well, I think uh, it's a combination. I think certainly from what I saw in my research, the, the the big kind of bosses of Barbie, I think, are just very kind of, you know, work capitalists, let's jump on this trend, it'll make us visible. Um, I'm, sh- well, I'm sure, specifically in the case of Barbie, that there are actual critical race theorists working within the ranks just because of the level of detail um, in that video, for instance, with Barbie and her black friend and the type, the terminology they were using was very, very, very specific to critical race theory. Um, And certainly with the, you know, the pushing of, on the YouTube page as well, there was, Barbie had done a vlog with her Phoebe or or just talking about how she'd had this fictional experience in in a a volunteer group and the male leader uh, didn't pay enough attention to her and her female friends but when her male friends said the same ideas then the male leader was uh was just really happy with those ideas and I'm like oh my god you look this is feminist critical theory (laughs) that is that is the (laughs) script script. that's the script there are I've heard that many times. Me. Many yeah. times, exactly. Um, so I think maybe there are people within the ranks who are like that. But in terms of who they're actually marketing to, sp- certainly the Instagram page I think is marketing to the mothers. Um, I don't think the Instagram page itself uh, is marketing to the kids. I think it's the mothers because mothers are the ones who do most of the shopping and mothers of small children nowadays are sort of in their kind of in, the, in their thirties. They're sort of Generation Y. They tend to tilt leftwards, um, and you know Instagram sort of promotes that kind of stuff. So I think it's they're looking for ideologically driven, trendy, yummy mummies. 
um, who see this sort of, oh, my God, Barbie is, has, a pres- has a presidential candidate doll. Oh, my God, I'm so going to buy that for little Sarah because, oh, my God, that's just going to set her on the right path. So I, I think, again, well, I think there are people within that organization who are very serious about the ideology ultimately they're just marketing to the mums, you know, <laughs> that's what I reckon. Yeah. Now, do you have a problem or do you have an issue with the way that they're marketing the feminism part? Like the, oh, Barbie's going to go be president or, you know, class president or something like that. Uh, I just, I don't think it's necessary. I, I, I don't think people should be propagating politics onto children and young teens. It's it's not appropriate. Older teens, you know, 16, 17, I can understand because they're going to be of voting age very soon and should probably be, you know, thinking about it if they're interested. But, like, why why would you market a, a presidential campaign doll to a five-year-old? I mean, for one thing, the five-year-old's probably not going to be interested. Like, why would she want to play with that? Where's the fairy princess outfit? But I, I don't think it's appropriate. I don't know why they want to push this stuff onto kids unless, of course, um, the ideologues in the company are, are very serious about getting them when, they, what, getting when they're young. What's that, what's that saying? You know, give me the child at seven and I'll, I'll have him for life. Like it's, it's quite insidious. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, geez. Who said that? Oh, um, well, some, some wasn't Stalin, but it was dude. someone like Stalin. One of those dictators. I can't remember who, but it's quite famous. Oh no no it wasn't who was it <laughs> Daisy it wasn't Stalin it was the Jesuits oh, was oh my god that's even worse <laughs> but it's true though like you know they they had their own kind you know propaganda to push and their own um agenda to push and they'll yeah give give me the child at seven and I'll and I'll have him for life but yeah it's a similar principle yeah yeah it, it is a similar like they'll get um get you in the system for sure. Um, and, and you're kind of, um, there, there is a kind of reprogramming element to this whole thing. Um, I would say, because you're, you're absolutely right, Daisy. I, when I think about it, does a five-year-old girl or does a four-year-old girl really have a strong committed interest in being president or are they at the point where they're like, yeah, I could be president or I could like not be president. And like, they needed like an extra push to go and like be president. <laughs> and like, I, I don't think they're, at, I don't think they're anywhere near that. I think most of them just want to play and like, look at things that are pretty. Yeah. And that was always Barbie's appeal to the little kids, you know, whether it's healthy or not, that was always Barbie's appeal to little kids. And I don't see how this newly added discrimination and woke narrative stuff is going to make this Barbie any more appealing to kids, but maybe it's appealing to, you're right, to the mothers, you know, who are now 30 and part of a more liberal generation and want to feel good buying this thing for their kid or Daisy, an even more cynical thesis, (laughs) maybe the Barbie people are aware that their product, that the Barbie product is kind of a, is a product that actually is not a very progressive product at all. I mean, first of all, it actually like gives a beauty standard and the progressives don't like, you know, having standards of beauty and fitness because, you know, it's uh, oppressive to people who don't fit that. Um, and then the other thing about Barbie is that, you know, Barbie was always traditionally kind of like blonde haired and blue eyed and that's white and that's white privilege. And there's, and then, you know, and so maybe people, and, and so maybe, you know, people who are in this movement and mothers who are in this movement, you know, Barbie, they see, they need some way to like, uh, refine Barbie's, uh, woke credentials, or else, you know, they're afraid that they'll just be targeted as another, uh, I guess, uh, conservative or reactionary uh, icon. Well, yeah, again, uh, there's that whole sort of element of, of placating the activists. You know, I, I swear to God, that's why, you know, for, for Pride Month, for instance, you know, so many big corporations are like, look, whoa, rainbow flag, you know, please don't attack us on Twitter. Like it, it is a lot of it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a shield uh, for the radicals basically. And I, I think all corporations have probably cottoned onto that and they've, they've seen what the radicals will do if you don't so at least appear to be kind of conforming um, to that. So, and I don't think Barbie is mean from that at all. But, but do you see, do you see my, 
and, and feel free to disagree with me. Do you see my point about Barbie though? Like, do you see how like the very idea of Barbie as like something that I, I guess, do you see like the very, how the very idea of Barbie could potentially anger progressives? Oh, completely. Yeah. There's, there's, um, so much about her that could, you know, as you mentioned, she's very, very white, like the, the blonde hair, blue eyes, um, very, you know, Anglo-Saxon. Um, and certainly she's, she's, she's typified sort of, um, you know, she, I mean, she was actually very radical for her day. Like in the sixties, you had this ad- adult doll who, um, she was, she's always been a bit radical for, you know, this, this sort of adult doll who was a sort of independent woman and she wasn't married and she, you know, had careers and stuff. So she actually, she's always been quite progressive, but she still kind of typifies those old school, um, standards of, of beauty and the way that women, you know, the feminine, the way that women conducted themselves in sort of a, a feminine way, which the which feminists do not like at all. And also, she's unbelievably heterosexual, so heterosexual yeah. <laughs> with, with, with Ken. That's so you know, true, she was Ken. With Ken. For like 50 years. And then um, yeah. from memory, she broke up with Ken, but she didn't sort of go through a, a, mm-hmm. a queer phase. She, she ended up with another, <laughs> I think it was an Australian surfer called Blaine, like that they, they created another, wow. I think so, yeah, they created another boyfriend for her. So there's so much about Barbie um, that is not progressive at all. Um, so, so yeah, the, well. they, they've got to shield themselves somehow. From them. <laughs> that is so, that is so fascinating, Daisy. Uh, that is, you're right. Well, I know that you've gotten our audience hooked on or you're fascinated by Barbie, <laughs> which is maybe not something that we initially thought we were going to be fascinated by, but you got me fascinated by Barbie, Daisy. Is there any- <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to say about this conversation or about Barbie? No, I think I think we've I think we've pretty well covered it, but it is it is just so interesting to observe um the ins and outs of these big corporations nowadays and how they handle politics and popular culture and and how in speculating on how much of it is genuine and how much of it is is just capitalism, I always find c- kind of interesting, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's it's good to get the, you know, what what is the woke capitalism and what is the actual ideological wokeness behind it? Um, uh, Daisy, uh, thank you so much for being on. Um, to, to our viewers, you know, p- go ahead, follow Daisy, Daisy Cousins. Uh, follow her on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. She puts out great YouTube videos talking about all of these subjects that we're talking about. Um, give her a shout out. And I really appreciate you appearing on the podcast, Daisy. Thank you so much for having me. This was really, really fun. (laughs) Good, good. I'm glad. Talk to you soon. And that was my interview with Daisy Cousins. Uh, It was a great interview, as you guys could tell. You know, we had a great conversation, great back and forth. Talked a a lot about, you know, Australian society. And I wanted to touch on that a little bit because she mentioned some really interesting points about Australian society, particularly with with regards to its multiculturalism. Now, Daisy made the contention, she made the assertion that Australia was one of the most multiculturally tolerant societies in the world, in the nation. And so obviously I had to go back. I had to look up some of the data. And, you know, it turns out, yeah, Australia as, as a whole in terms of wanting racial tolerance in terms of being okay with having a neighbor of a different race, you know, ranks very high, you know, right up there with the United States. And it generally follows the pattern, by the way, that Anglo countries, countries that have Anglo heritage actually tend to be some of the most racially tolerant countries in the entire world. Of course, you know, the left wouldn't tell you that they like to believe that the U S and these kinds of things are, you know, racially, um, just in a horrible place. And obviously we have a ways to go, but actually if you look compared to the world, you know, countries like the United States, um, like Australia, like Latin, Latin American countries as well tend to have much, uh, more tolerant views on racial diversity than countries like India or countries like South Korea, actually, which is funny because you think South Korea is a developed economy. You must have high views of racial tolerance, but actually, um, it's, uh, you know, 
over 25% of the residents in South Korea do not want to have a neighbor of another race. You know, in India, there's a lot of problems with racial tolerance as well. Um, and that's for another topic. But I, I was actually talking um, with a, an Indian woman over there. And, and the problem over there necessarily isn't necessarily race because, I mean, everybody's, a, you know, an Indian. <laughs> everybody's an Indian. Um, but the problem there is with religion and um, having Muslims, uh, Muslims, Christians, Hindus all coming together can provide for some tension, not necessarily because they disliked each other, but because the government is establishing a sort of preferential treatment system there, according to some sources. Um, but back to Australia, right? Okay, so the first part of our assertion, you know, this is a multicultural society, you know, racially tolerant society. That is, that is largely true. But, you know, I, every time someone makes a bold claim like that, I mean, I even asked her, like, is Australia a more racially multicultural society than even the United States, you know, where we have great diversity? And, you know, you go back into um, Australia's statistics in, in terms of their racial demographics. It, it turns out the minority race in Australia, you know how in America the minority race is black Americans and Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans. The minority race in, in Australia uh, is Asian Americans. Isn't that so interesting? Isn't that so fascinating? Particularly Chinese Americans. And it is true that Chinese Americans actually take up a huge percentage of, you know, the schools and the selective schools in Australia. And but Daisy makes a really interesting point that's worth investigating, which is there doesn't seem to be the kind of animosity, um, at least among the progressives in Australia towards, you know, having Asians and Chinese people in these selective schools as there is in America. Um, now, that might change in two years because we also discussed America being the epicenter of culture and the whole idea of attacking Asians has become kind of a relatively new phenomenon. It might creep into Australia pretty soon. In fact, that's one prediction I would suspect would probably occur. But, but if you actually look at the racial demographics of Australia, um, I'll read it to you right here. The 10 most commonly reported ancestries in 2016 were English, Irish, Scottish, Australian, um, which could mean any number of things, Italian, German, Greek, or Italian and German, and then Chinese, and then Indian. Chinese and Indian um, make up a very significant percentage of the population in Australia. Now, 26% of Australians were born overseas. So Australia does have a large foreign-born population. In fact, it has a larger foreign-born population as a percentage of its population than America does. So in that sense, it is pretty multicultural. But in terms of having um, underprivileged minorities in, or traditionally underprivileged minorities, as is the racial discourse in America, there isn't that much... There isn't that much of the sense of underprivileged minorities because Asians are not considered an underprivileged minority in Australia because they get into the selective schools and they tend to actually do pretty well for themselves. Um, in terms of whiteness and race, and, and I feel free to correct me if there is a commentator out there who would like to correct me, but there is one example of an underprivileged minority in Australia, and that minority is the indigenous aboriginal Australians. And they make up about 2.8% of the Australian population. The indigenous Australians, you know, the ones that were conquered, that were sent to, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and that, you know, they continue to make lower incomes than the than traditional Australians. Maybe that's evidence from the left to say, oh, you know, Australia is still reckoning with systemic racism in this country. But, you know, I don't necessarily buy that argument because, you know, there's a lot more factors if you're an indigenous Australian than just systemic racism. I mean, your country, your culture is not Anglo, right? Your culture is indigenous to the to the continent. And so, you know, you're going to have more struggles with language. You're probably going to have more cultural barriers. 
Um, and you know, the sad thing about a lot of indigenous populations, uh, is that I can probably see what's reflected in America also being happening in Australians, which where the native American population in America is not doing so hot as well. But, uh, you know, a significant portion is because the government, um, you know, has, has, has applied this caretaking role to the native American population and, you know, huge, a lot of this reservation space uh, towards Native Americans, but hasn't really invested in the culture of Native, uh, of, of Native Americans to the point where they are able to compete with Anglo and Asian Americans and even Black Americans and Hispanic Americans in society. Because, you know, say what you want, but Native Americans in America in this country come with a greatly different set of cultural values. Um, and, and obviously the process of assimilation into American society as it is with any immigrant, but I would say it's even stronger with native American immigrants is that the process of assimilation is, is rendered difficult because there is there, you really are torn. You really are torn between your indigenous Aboriginal, not Aboriginal native American heritage and then also coming into American culture, you know, I read this. Um, I read this book when I was in uh, middle school. It's it was called "The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian" by Sherman Alexie. And you know, he, in this book, he described the tension that he had to undergo. You know, trying to blend into American society, but still kind of tethered to the Native American uh, culture and those kinds of things. And that really grated at him. That really made him unable to really capture the whole of the assimilation of the American identity and therefore enjoy the fruits of becoming a fully assimilated American. And I suspect that's probably the case with the indigenous Aborigines um, in, uh, in Australia. And so that, that raises the question, you know, with indigenous populations, whether in America or in the, um, or in the Australian continent, how much can you really do to help these people? And obviously the, um, the counterpoint to that is, well, we've done so much to hurt them in the past. I mean, yes, of course, America has, you know, conquered Indian territories, sent them off to, do in, in their reserved lands and things like that. But you have to also understand that before America came into North America, before, you know, white Americans and uh, European Americans came and conquered the land, it's not like the Native Americans were advanced and, and living in Wakanda or anything like that. I mean, they were fighting with each other and they were still technologically vastly below the technological skill of European Americans when they came. So the preser you know, in the sense that their culture still puts them in the sense that they still have to understand elements of their own original culture is in a sense where someone could make an argument and actually could say, yeah, well, yes, of course, America did bad things to them, but they weren't necessarily in a great place to start out uh, in terms of cultural quality of life indicators and those kinds of things. And therefore, in the sense, to the extent that they're still tethered to that, they're still tethered to somewhat of a backwards culture. And maybe it's the case with the Aborigines as well uh, in Australia. So I wanted to touch on that because I wanted to explore a little bit with you guys about Australian society, about um, minorities in Australian society. There was this chart that I saw in the conversation on Australian society and their attitudes towards race. And it said that, you know, the majority of them had negative attitudes towards Muslim, not, sorry, not the majority of them. 31% of them had a somewhat negative or very negative attitude towards Muslim Australians. 23% of Australians have a somewhat negative or very negative attitude towards Middle Eastern Australians. Um, only 7% of Australians have a somewhat negative or very negative attitude towards Asian Australians. Interestingly enough, very interesting. And it, it, it go, kind of goes back to this, this tension and this problem with a lot of European countries right now too, where a lot of 
Europeans are feeling threatened by Muslims moving in to Europe, and so they're developing these hostile attitudes towards them. And then the Muslims, because in some some cases, in some places, you know, the Muslims, um, the perception is that the Muslims are um, are coming into and and you know, there's this f- potential feeling of they aren't assimilating as well into the European culture as well as they could assimilate. And people like to make this argument, you know, well, that means you're racist against Muslims. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not going to deny that argument necessarily. I mean, maybe they are, maybe there is racism against Muslims in Europe, in Europe and, um, and in Australia as well. The, the, the interesting thing about Australia though, is With Muslims, they are a pretty insignificant part or um, demographic in Australia. They're just it's it's not it's not it's not a huge thing. So it's not like you know Muslims are coming in five percent, six percent, seven percent of the country. That's not that's just not really the case. Most people in Australia probably don't necessarily know a Muslim Australian. You know, unless they're in a really cosmopolitan part of Australia, like Sydney or Melbourne or something like that, they probably don't know another Muslim Australian. And so their picture of a Muslim Australian is probably informed by the things that they see in the media and they see in the TV, not not based on the experiences of them actually interacting with actual Muslims. So if they have a negative attitude towards it, it's probably because they've absorbed the stereotypes from, you know, other European countries um, about Muslims in these kinds of countries and those kinds of things. And so there's two kinds of racial negativity, right? There's the racial negativity that's like, I don't like them in theory. And then there's the racial negativity about it actually happening in practice. In the case of Muslim Australians, although there are some Muslim Australians who definitely would experience racism from native, native Australians, particularly if they're conspicuously Muslim, you know, you also have to understand that the racism that even if there is potential racism among native Australians against Muslim Australians, the net effect of that or the net effect of that may be mitigated by the fact that there are just not that many Muslim Australians to be racist against and harass. That may explain a little bit more about what Daisy is talking about when she, when she says, oh, I think Australia is a really multicultural society. It's really tolerant. Um, and and maybe that's that's why I grant her that because the he would call it like the majority minority, which are Asian Australians. The significant minority seems to be having a fairly positive image in Australian society. There hasn't yet been the kind of pushback against these people taking over the schools. Um, the other other kinds of minorities um, generally seem accepted except for maybe Muslim and Middle Eastern Australians. Um, but they form an insignificant part of Australian society. And then the Aborigines and indigenous Australians, you know, have their own set of problems and maybe that reflects an ignorance on Australian society on them. But at the same time, how much can you really do to help them? So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about in terms of Australian society and, and maybe making the case that she's right Um, in the sense that maybe Australia is actually just a more racially tolerant place. You know, I don't know if maybe it's the surf vibes or something like that, or maybe it's the fact that like everybody in Australia, most of the people who migrated to Australia, you know, came, you know, from British prisons and were outcasts of society anyway. And so maybe their society more welcoming of outcasts, you know, culture definitely matters, here, so I wanted to to touch on that a little bit about say maybe she's right, maybe she's wrong, um, but it's definitely something worth talking about. The second thing that I wanted to talk about was about Barbie, and particularly about how woke capitalism influences Barbie and how Barbie influences woke capitalism. One of the things that Daisy and I talked about with regards to Barbie was that Barbie. Is a symbol, right? She's something, she's a symbol and she's a brand. And why is she a brand? Because she's pretty. Guys, Barbie is pretty. Like she's objectively an, an, a female icon 
she wouldn't be have the mainstream popularity that she had if she was ugly. Okay. That's just not how it works. What do young girls like? Young girls like pretty things. They like doing hair. They like doing, you know, they like walking them around. Remember what Daisy Cousins said at the end of the podcast, Barbie actually, when it was initially released was kind of a progressive icon (laughs) because she had her own career and she she had her own career and she was kind of a, 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 a very capable seeming woman. Yeah. She had unhealthy proportions and stuff like that, but that is just the result of her brand. That is her brand. And so this whole woke thing that Daisy brought up with regards to Barbie coming into this anti-racism and talking about black beauty standards and those kinds of things, it just seems so awkward it just seems so awkward that Barbie would be the one preaching these woke messages uh, because Barbie is in itself kind of an, uh, an anti-progressive phenomenon because she's objectively pretty and, you know, and also maybe unhealthily even so. She's blonde haired, blue eyed, white person, probably would be called a Karen <laughs> in today's culture. She, although progressive of her time, now she, I mean, Daisy made a great point. She's heterosexual and she's like stringently heterosexual. Like she had one boyfriend, Ken, like her whole life. And then when she broke up with him, she found another surfer boyfriend, Blaine. And that's like super heterosexual. You know, she didn't experiment with her uh, gender or sexual identity after breaking up with Ken. There's a reason, I think, for progressive the progressive community to resent Barbie because she represents, a, one, a beauty standard, which, you know, if you have a beauty standard, obviously there are people who fall short of that standard uh, who may feel oppressed by that. And so that's anti-progressive. And so maybe what Maddle was thinking about, you know, the woke capitalist thinking, oh, I want to make money. Um, I want to make money. I want to, I don't want to lose the brand of Barbie, but we're going to make Barbie like super woke now. We're going to make her like super anti-racist now. And we're going to have Barbie in conversation with her black friend of Barbie. This black friend of Barbie is going to talk about beauty standards and how it affects black women. First of all, I sympathize with the idea that beauty standards may have racial codifications, okay? I mean, I I was the one who brought it up to Daisy. I mean, I even told her, like, hey, have you looked at this OkCupid data? Have you looked at this Hinge data? You know, black women are the people that are primarily out of contention. And actually, Asian women are actually most desirable in some cases, I mean, white women and Asian women are kind of tied. Latina women, really, but black women are like pretty far down. It's kind of sad. And you wonder why that is. You wonder why that is. I mean, these are apps that are based on, you know, three second evaluations of, of, of physical attraction. Like when, when men look at women, they take like two seconds, maybe three seconds, and they figure out, oh, are they attractive? Are they attractive for me? Maybe there is an attractiveness problem with black women going on today, but maybe it's something more latent because a lot of the pop stars, and she's also right about this, a lot of the pop stars are very dark. Kim Kardashian, you know, Beyonce, you know, Lizzo is, is kind of becoming an icon now. And it kind of raises like the question, and like this is like a really touchy question this is a touchy question that i don't really know the answer to but it's kind of like how much does pop culture reflect society because in some sense like these people are representation and are inspiring for you know the people who maybe look like them obviously nobody really looks like beyonce but maybe for the people who can identify with beyonce maybe it's inspiring but I mean, how does it really inspire? I mean, think about the process. Like how does, if you are, you know, an an unattractive 
person or, you know, maybe a person, let's I mean, basically if you're not Beyonce, let's say you're like not Beyonce, okay? And you look at Beyonce and Beyonce is so hot <laughs> and you're like, oh man, I'm so inspired by her hotness. <laughs> Why don't, I mean, who does, who is to say that is your reaction when you see Beyonce representing you? And rather than your reaction could also be, oh man, Beyonce is so hot. I could never come up to her. I'm just, I'm just a lost case. I'm, I'm a loser, you know, uh, go back and eat some ice cream, you know, eat like a, like a whole halo top carton or something like that. <laughs> I mean, who's to say that one reaction is preferred over the other? I mean, yeah, Beyonce could be representation, but she could also be like a really unhealthy representation that motivates a lot of people the wrong way instead of the right way. You know, and so I know that pop culture is really trying to like do this whole representation thing. And I kind of get it why, because there are some issues, there are some underlying racial issues here. I mean, Asian men face the same problem. Don't get me wrong here. You know, uh, there are not a lot of Asian men in pop culture at all. And whenever they are, they're like completely in subordinating roles. But how much is like, for me, if I see an Asian in a dominant role on screen, like the only guy I can think of an Asian, like in a dominant role right now, other than like old Bruce Lee movies, is like that guy from Crazy Rich Asians. And Gosh, he was such a terrible actor. Like, he was so bad. Like, I was embarrassed to watch him. And he's not even, if he wasn't even a full Asian, he was like half British. That was like even more embarrassing because it was like, they couldn't even like actually hide, find someone who was like a real full 100% Asian. And he was still so bad. It was just so bad. Um, He was just not, not my taste. I don't know if some girls liked him. I didn't like him. I didn't like him at all. But I, it just comes to, to point out that representation doesn't necessarily what it, doesn't necessarily have the effect that you think it might have. You think, oh, we need we'll have more representation in media that's going to be so inspiring. It's going to inspire young kids to go and run for president and stuff like that, or young black people to feel better about themselves. And like the reality is, does it really make you feel better about yourself? Or does it make you even more discomforted by the fact that the visible culture seems so populated by all of these models and you're sitting here on your, you know, on your, on your couch eating ice cream with no prospects (laughs) to begin with? (laughs) I mean, I could see it really go either way here, guys. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about, uh, with regards to Barbie in the sense that they're trying to do this representation thing with her. They're trying to do this progressive thing with Barbie, but it really just doesn't work because Barbie is not a progressive, is not the vision of what progressivism is going right now. And so the best way to describe what what is happening to Barbie right now and the social justification of Barbie is that it's woke capitalism. It's business leaders deciding to make business decisions and saying, our brand, we need to protect our brand. We need to protect the essence of Barbie. But, you know, if we put all of the social justice stuff on her, maybe people would gloss over that and let us keep selling this anti-progressive icon (laughs) so i don't know whose side are you guys on let me know um i always really appreciate it you can always send me an email inconvenientminority at gmail.com is an email you can send it to Um, you can also dm me on twitter at kenny m shoe um and if you feel so inclined to support me which i would just be absolutely love your support as I talk and I interview and I have hard hitting conversations with people like Daisy Cousins. You're talking about Barbie, talking about beauty standards, talking about race, getting to these uncomfortable conversations. But overall, you know, doing it with a sense of hope 
Come and support me at inconvenientminority.com. There you can make your donation. You can make a monthly recurring donation. Support this book, support this podcast, support our work in our culture today. Um, another thing you can do, tell your friends about this podcast. Leave a review on our podcast. Reviews really matter. And if you want more people to see it, leave a review. Really appreciate you tuning in today. Thank you for listening to the Inconvenient Minority Podcast. <laughs>